certain relationships, certain connections we have that go back to the foundation of the world. And it is with great honor and with great pleasure that I present to you in the spirit realm a man that I know was created by God to reveal the mysteries of the last generation. He is a, uh, a mentor to me. He's a, he's a brother to me. He's a friend to me. He, um, he has encouraged me in the things of the divine nature. He's encouraged me in the things of the spirit that are radical. But more than that, this man is known by his love. And he believes truly that there is a restoration of apostolic intent, the succession of the apostles, and the sovereign outpouring of our generation. And there are so many things that have been lost on both sides that he sees needs to be restored. See, you can't, Eucharist is important, but Eucharist without community is not Eucharist. You can receive the body and blood, but if you don't have community, you've not had the Eucharist. It takes community and the body and blood. You can't just have one without the other. He also sees the need for the freshness of the Spirit to have total liberty in our worship, yet the beauty of liturgical worship, which was what Paul practiced, what John practiced, what the early disciples believed was the preservation of the intent of the church. And so we are facing a great battle in the last days as people are delivered from the precepts and traditions of men. And I believe this is the man God has chosen. One of many men, but a man he has chosen for the restoration of the church. And those of you that know him, those of you that don't, it won't be very long and you won't even be paying attention to the cassock on the cross. Because he is not what he wears, he is who he is by the grace of God. And God helped the church get delivered from identifying us by what we wear or don't wear. And let us be identified by who we are in Christ. So, I present to you a man of God that is full of humility and love, yet has a perception and understanding of the kingdom. Archbishop Mari Nak, Bishop Haran Ash, would you welcome him as a Amen. Let's just bow our heads. Father, we thank you for for it is truly right to give you thanks and praise. And I thank you that today you're going to speak to us, but not as unto babes, but as unto fathers, not as unto children, but as unto a generation of people that will feed the next generation. We thank you that you're not going to speak to us from the outer court, but rather from the Holy of Holies. Tonight you're not going to feed us with bread or with milk, but you're going to feed us with meat. For Lord, it is meat that the resurrected daughter of Jairus desired. We thank you, O oh God, that there is a church that is being resurrected, that is being restored, that is being refreshed, renewed, revived, reconciled. And when this church wakes up, she is going to want meat. For only meat can truly feed those that are of full age. So, Father, we thank you today that the discerning factor of maturity is not spiritual gifts, but it is the ability to consume and revelate meat. Give us meat. Meat that we know not of. Meat which is to do the will of God. Now, Father, we thank you that today you're going to declare your mysteries to your people. And we're going to see you in ways we've never seen you before. We've come to preach you. We've not come to preach about you. We've come to preach you. That when men understand who you are, they will be changed into your image. They will cease to be themselves and they will become you. So this is your desire that men might be saved, not by the infinite knowledge of you, but by the immediate knowledge of your church. And so, God, we pray today that we will be changed by the words that we hear and we will be conformed to your image in ways that we have not thought in times past. But today we will be accountable for the truth that you've given to us. We thank you that today, oh God, you're opening the heavens. We thank you that our deep is being broken up. We thank you that even beyond that, that you're going to declare even today the things that the seven thunders uttered that John heard. And John said, I cannot repeat them. Father, I've come to declare what John heard but could not repeat. I've come to preach what John couldn't write. We've come to declare the hidden mysteries of the heart, the hidden mysteries of your heart, 
For it is your desire that men might come to all truth. Father, we thank you that truth is not a new book. The truth is not a new television program, but all truth is a realm of the spirit where every man can know you equally, where every man can know you on their own, by their own testimony. Father, I thank you today that we shall all know you from the infant to the sire. We shall all know you and we shall be changed into that that we know. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, the Lord bless you. God bless you. Bless you, prophet. I'm excited for what God's doing next week. Some great things are taking place. Shandai, hook him aside. Shoot a mosquito, kickstart a Honda. Oh, mama, my knee hurt. I got to get some new ones. I'm put HBO, Showtime, Cinemax. <laughs> the Lord is good, and we're just excited to be here today again. Always glad to be here with my covenant friends and covenant brothers and sisters. This is the Feast of Transfiguration for me at my church. I keep missing feast days and everything coming here to y'all. I'm going to have to put a demand. I need a little chapel somewhere in a corner where I can light my candles and swing my incense somewhere. Because I feel bad, you know, on a Sunday if I don't, I have to, you know, if I can't swing incense, I just got to light a stick and <laughs> wave it back and forth. <laughs> It's as close as I get, so. But, um, I was supposed to be somewhere else, and the Lord, actually, I was supposed to be in another city altogether. And, uh, the Lord put a tremendous demand on me not to go at all. I can't call them and cancel them altogether. I've been wrestling with it for a couple of weeks and didn't understand why, because I wasn't going to be able to go to Duluth with the Apostle and Prophet. And, um, and I mean, at the last minute, I just, I called my secretary and said, we'll call him and say, I'm not coming. And she said, uh, 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 yeah, just tell him. I said, well, what, I, why? What, what's the reason? Tell him I'm sick of religion. So, so, and prophets don't go where they're booked. They go where God tells them to go. And I'm looking forward for the day when we don't have to book meetings anymore. That churches submit to the prophetic and say, this house is your house. You come when God tells you to come. Not if there's a plan or a date or a revival or a conference, but, but they can come and speak. Prophets can just go. And God's restoring the church where the voice of God can go where it wants to go, when it's supposed to go. Amen. And not people not be worried. We're not businessmen and we're not booked on a calendar. We're booked by God's time. And Samuel had to come a day late so that Saul can offer sacrifice because God never intended Saul. God always intended David. And what we call Saul's sin was God's purpose. We condemned Saul for only being obedient because God never really wanted Saul. Shandai. I'm just setting a platform. I'm going to get in trouble today. But then when do I not get in trouble? So, If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Second Thessalonians, the second chapter. When they, when they were singing that song, I'm the first, I'm the last, the Lord really began to drop something into my spirit because Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. And when you understand it, the Alpha is the author, the Omega implies consummation, to consummate the consumption of the last age, which means all things, all things come from God, Alpha, all things go back to God, Omega. Let me say that again. All things come from God, Alpha. All things go back to God, Omega. If it came from Him, it returns to Him. That cannot return if it did not come from Him. And if something came from someplace else and did not come from Him, then there is another Creator, which implies that God is not absolute. So, Again, what we are constantly in the process of doing, Jesus told us to preach the kingdom. Jesus told us to, he identified himself in the book of Revelation as the Alpha and Omega. So he is the beginning of all things. He is the end of all things. He has the first say and the last say. That means if he originates it, he, he writes the first chapter, he writes the last chapter. That means... He is in charge of all things. There's nothing going on that he doesn't know. You have never surprised him once. 
There is nothing you have ever done that has ever shocked them. There is nothing anyone has ever said, any place they've ever been, that God looked at and said, I didn't expect that from them. Now, in order to understand that, you've got to understand, first of all, that how he started things, and then you've got to understand how he's going to finish things. When you understand the alpha idea and the omega idea, then you can understand everything else. The reason, the problem is, is that most of us establish our theology on beta, gamma, lama, lamsa, all of the other different in-betweens, the alpha and the omega. And we're trying, that's where you get a fake doctrine of a rapture. That's where you get a false doctrine of hell. That's where you get a false perception of, of, of heaven. That's where you get a false perception of Satan. You get a false perception of Lucifer. You begin to create doctrines because you never invest it to understand the beginning and the ending. Listen, there's two important things in a mystery book. The first chapter and the last chapter. The last chapter tells you who did it. The first chapter tells you what they did. And I always cheat. I cheat when I read mystery books. I like to know the last chapter and the first chapter. I don't have to read in between. Why have to read all those chapters? Just teach me the first and the last. I cheated in school when they said you got to do the pro- show me how you work it out. That's not important. The important thing is you give me the equation, I give you the answer. How I got there don't matter as long as the answer's right. Shanda. Teacher says, I want to see you work it out. And that's how the church is. The church is concerned with how you did it. It don't matter how you did it. If the answer's wrong, it's wrong. And everybody's trying to work out the equation, trying to get the right, well, it, you just have to do it correctly. And they're still coming up with the wrong answer. Here's the right answer. Here's your alpha. God made man in his own image. Here's your omega. In the end of time, all men will be in his image again. Here's your alpha. You want alpha? I'll give you alpha. Here's alpha. If God wanted man in heaven, he'd have put him in heaven in the beginning. He didn't put man in heaven, so heaven is not your goal. He put man on the earth. So here's your omega. If he put man on the earth, in the end, he's going to be in the earth. So heaven is not your omega. Heaven is not the last chapter. The last chapter is the same as the first chapter. God has never changed his mind. If God wanted a rapture in the first place to escape from making mistakes, the moment Adam was about to eat, he would have raptured him. He didn't rapture him because God does not have an emergency evacuation. If there's no rapture in the garden, there's no rapture in the last chapter. And if in the first chapter... Knowledge of good and evil kill you? In the last chapter, there will be no knowledge of good and evil. There will be only life. Amen? Now, I can figure out what I'm preaching on. Oh, here we go. Where are we going? We don't know. If you insist. <laughs> what did I say? Second Thessalonians. That's right. Let's see here. How many know that mysteries are not hid from us? They're hid for us. How many know if it's hid for us and all mysteries are from God? Mysteries are from God. It is the pleasure the glory of God to conceal a thing is the pleasure of a king, or the glory of a king rather, to search it out. So God conceals it, kings find it. Hello, king of kings. Hello, lord of lords. Hello, savior of saviors. That's right there in Obadiah 21. That you are saviors. And I miss you. There's only one Savior. It astounds me that Protestants who left the ancient church because they didn't give them a Bible still don't read the Bible that they got. You should have stayed and stayed with us. Verse 
Verse 7 of the second chapter says this. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. We're going to deal with the Greek text on that a little later on. But I want you to hear that the scripture says that the mystery of iniquity is already working. And if it's a mystery, it comes from God. It doesn't come from the devil. And if there's a mystery, there's something about iniquity that we need to know. There's a mystery in it that we need to understand. There's a mystery in iniquity that the church needs to make an investment instead of just preaching against it. We need to understand it. What we've done is we've built a generation of preachers that all they can do is preach against but have never made an investment to understand why. If there is an issue in somebody's life, it's not enough just to tell them no. No doesn't work. Nancy Reagan came up with a campaign, just say no. Since we've been saying no, drug use has went up. But sometimes saying no only makes things worse. Especially with this generation. The more you tell them no, the more they want to find out what's so bad about it. You drive them to it. Amen? Ephesians, the second chapter. I want to talk. I'm I'm not going to be long. I would be offended if I wasn't orthodox. If it wasn't a feast day. Verse 1 through 3. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Among whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lust of the flesh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature... The children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace. Ye are saved. That's very powerful there because he implies that salvation has to do with quickening By becoming together with Christ. Salvation is not accepting him as your personal Lord and Savior. It is becoming one with him. So you got a bunch of people coming up, shaking your hand, getting a free Bible and filling out your postcard. And saying, thank you, I'm saved now. And they have not been connected or quickened. Quicken means to receive life from becoming one or coming together with Christ, which you cannot do by your own merit. It is a miraculous work by the grace of God. And that's why our churches are not packed, because we're still telling them that they need to accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. And that is not the clarion call from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ. His call to them is to become one with him, not to become friends with him. Jesus does not need friends. He is not on Prozac. He needs a body. He wants his glory to fill the whole earth. So salvation has to do with being quickened together with him. For by grace, for by charis are you saved. For by grace are you coming into the fullness. Of God's purpose, salvation is not a one-time event. It is an eternal process because we are constantly being changed from glory to glory. We are going in Hebrews, the sixth chapter, and the first verse, we are going on to perfection. You're not saved because you prayed a prayer or because you've been baptized. You must go on to perfection. First Corinthians 13, you are being changed from glory to glory. So there is a constant process. The Bible says we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away with prophecy all of the things that we are experiencing in this move of God are signs that we are still walking out part because I'm here to tell you when we come into that which is perfect you won't need someone else to tell you the voice of God or the mind of God you will hear him for yourself now we are not there yet 
Do not allow yourself to feel that you are in that place at this moment. We need to hear the voices of the prophets and the apostles that God has given us to this point. But their purpose, our purpose, is to bring you to the place to hear God for yourself. So that's the call of God. So what's happening now is that it is by... So we're constantly coming... Uh, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs that there is a light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. There is a light that shineth more and more even unto the perfect day. The closer we get to the end of the kingdom of God, the more we're going to know. People know less because they're far away from the kingdom of God. Those who are connected to the kingdom know more. Revelation is not based... Let me say this to you. Revelation has nothing to do with you. It has to do with the revealer. It is revelation because God has chosen to reveal it. If you don't get it, he has not revealed it. What can I do to get it? Nothing. Nothing. When it is your time to get it, the revealer will reveal it. If it's if the revealer don't reveal it, it ain't revelation. It's inspiration. And you need to get a if it's inspiration, you need to work for Hallmark, not preach in the church. Shanna. And I haven't even started. I'm just getting a few pet peeves off my chest. Or off my belly. I got more belly than I got chest. So, until we can understand what God is, I keep telling you this before, he that cometh to God must first believe that God is. God is. He that cometh to God must first identify who and what God is. What qualifies God to be God. And this is, how do you judge theology or doctrine against God? That we be no more children tossed to and free, tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. How are we no more children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine? Because you must come up to the perfect measure and the stature of Jesus Christ. Which means you measure everything in your life to Him. Now, when you measure it to Him, if it doesn't come up to His standard of excellence, throw it out. If any doctrine is preached that does not come to the standard of God, throw it out. And what we do is we accept doctrines that belittle God. Yet, if I got up here and said something, if if I said something that would make you mad, you know, people get mad all the time and stuff, but if I say, I am God, or you are God, people will tell you, you have just stripped God of His glory. But I'm saying in my mind, You're saying, I stripped God of His glory because I say I'm God, but you still preach that the devil is warring against God. Now, which theology strips God of what identifies or qualifies Him to be God? Not me wanting to be like Him. Any daddy is proud when his son says, I want to be like my daddy. That ain't stripping him of his glory. But if, if, if your own son tells you, my friend daddy can whoop my daddy's butt, his son, his own father hangs his head in shame that his son would believe that there is someone stronger than him. Yet the church refuses to identify with the divinity of God and yet preaches that there is another power that can win a war against God who has all power. So we identify God. And once we identify God... Then we identify doctrine. The call is not to doctrine, the call is to God. Doctrine is a secondary circumstance that you walk into sound doctrine because you know God. The problem is we don't know God. We know God based on doctrine, but doctrine, you don't know God based on doctrine. You know doctrine based on God. That was the problem with Adam. Adam wanted to know what's right and wrong. God says, I don't want you to know what's right and wrong. I want you to know me. Instead of Adam making an investment in God, he made an investment in knowledge. And knowledge kills. Life was right there. He didn't want it. Same thing in the church today. Instead of eating life, we eat knowledge. We want to determine who's right and who's wrong. We want to go on our spiritual right-wing propaganda tour. Instead of moving in the fullness of what God has for us. So what is the mystery of iniquity? We have to talk about that because it is, it is 
Uh, it is a process as we begin to walk this out, as we begin to understand what God is saying. Romans, the ninth chapter, 21st verse. Turn with me if you would. You already know this verse. Uh, Apostle Shell preaches this all the time in Romans, the 11th chapter. All things are of God, for of him are all things. Let me say that again. For of him are all things. Actually, one translation reads, for out of him are all things. Now, if all things are of him, that which is just a, you could just never have to preach again if y'all would just get that verse. I could retire in my little monastery in India if y'all would just understand the simplistic profoundness, the paradoxical communication of that one verse. All things are of him. It's so simple that you need somebody to help you misunderstand it. All things are of him, which means if all things are of him, there's nothing else. When he said, I got all power, all means all. When he says all things will be reconciled, all means all. When he says, all shall live, all means all. When he said, all people shall come to me, all means all. There are over 900 passages of Scripture in both the Old and New Testament that say that God is going to get all. Everything. Everything. It's all His. Now, that's a very delivering message, and we'll see in a few minutes why. In Romans, the 11th chapter. No, 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 I said Romans, the 9th chapter. We can preach for Romans 11, too. I mean, that's all right, too. You can preach for me, the one. Romans 9, 21, listen to what it says. Now, first of all, I want to help you here. I want to deliver you from a recent modern Christianity that has diminished God and has diminished the work of God in the church that has produced babies and not produced mature people. You've got to grow up. We've got to grow up together. We've got to grow up. We've got to become mature. The only way we can become mature is by understanding the fullness of what God is doing. And modern Christianity has not preached to us a doctrine that teaches us a proper doctrine. It has produced children and has not produced fathers. When you read a verse like this, this, kind, this verse I'm about to read makes Tulsa real nervous. But I'm going to read it anyway. Since we're the ones that gave you all the canon of the Bible. <laughs> hath not, verse 21, hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump of clay? He makes one vessel to honor and another vessel to dishonor. God makes one vessel for honor, and then goes and makes another vessel to dishonor. And both vessels came out of him. Both vessels were created by the genius of his infiniteness. Both vessels were created by an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God. And both vessels received their equal destiny from him. One to honor and another to dishonor. Hello, Peter. Hello, Judas. Both came out of him, both had a purpose, both were called by God, both fulfilled what God called them to do, both came from God, both helped God accomplish his purpose, and both will return to God when it's all over. Now, for some of you that are God's first cousin. You ain't never made a mistake. You ain't never sinned. You ain't never failed. For those of you that your whole family is just deep wonders in Zion. 
this message is shallow and weak and means nothing to you. But some of us have lost some loved ones. And we had to sit through some tired nickel dime preacher's sermon making us feel like this person has been rejected from the presence of God forever. We already deal with the pain of losing one we love, then we have to deal with the pain of listening to some untrained preacher feel better about himself while he makes us miserable about somebody that God made a vessel to dishonor. God gives us a message of hope that says it's not over till he says it's over. And that if God made all things, all things are by him, of him, and without him is nothing made that is made. So if it comes out of him, it goes back into him. The substance of the lump is the same for both. It's clay. It's the same for both. The substance is the same. The form is different. The form differs from one to another. That's why Romans 9, chapter 22nd verse, same thing says, What if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction that God puts up with? God endures the vessels of wrath unto destruction. Did you just see that or am I making that up? What if God willing to show that he ain't always good? He's always God. But he ain't always good. When the Bible says, For the Lord is good, and his mercy endures forever. That's a man saying, you know, if I say it to God enough, he will deal with me based on my worship of him. Nobody who sins goes around walking around saying, I love the Lord who sends people to hell. I love God. You tell me, I love the Lord who is full of mercy. God doesn't have to be good. God just has to be God. And sometimes, God endures the vessel he made for us. Why would he endure it? Because he made it. And if a heavenly, you know, this is what, I, it blows my mind. He, we just, you just dealt with it here in, 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 where am I? Denver. With the Columbine, was it Columbine? Tragedy. Those parents whose children did such a terrible thing, terrible thing, those parents love their sons, no matter what they did. Their love for their sons is not diminished. Their love for those kids is not diminished. And in, amidst the shame that they must deal with for the rest of their life, their heart, they may have questions, they may ask why, they may even blame themselves. But their heart has not been made in love for their own children. And if humanly, if human fleshly fathers are capable, if a human father can love his murderous son, then how much more a heavenly father? How much more would he not love those that he made? I always tell people in my church that if God knew I was going to be such a flake and a mess up, he had the option not to make me. But since he still made me, he just got to put up with me. I didn't ask to be born. Wasn't my intention. I never glorified an earthly existence from my heavenly realm. You never glorified it. God chose you before the foundation of the world to be born for such a time as this. From one extreme to the next. So, so why does he do that? 1 Corinthians 15, 25 says this. There's no 1 Corinthians says. This is very powerful when you understand. And here's another verse that I love. 
which I wish people would do something with. I don't know why they don't do nothing with the passages of Scripture they read. Verse 25 says, For he must reign till he puts all enemies under his feet. Verse 28 says, And when all things shall be subdued, not some things, all things will be subdued unto him. To him, all things will be subdued. Then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that putteth all things under him, that God may be all in all. Not in some. Hey, I'm a good person. Matter of fact, I think I'm a very good person. I'm a great person. In fact, I kind of like this. <laughs> I'm feeling better already. I'm not a bad person. I'm a good person. What glory does God get from rejoicing? He receives glory from me when he restores me to the kingdom. Of course he receives glory from me. But he receives more glory. From those who are not in the kingdom. And in the end, he is able to subdue evil death. In the end, with one glance of eternal love into their heart, those who have rejected them their whole life, choose him. You talking about, you think the angels shout now when men give their heart to Christ. When all are subdued to him, those who spend a lifetime saying, I will never submit, then God will sit in his throne and say, today, I am all in all. If one is lost, if one is lost, then he is not all. The omega, the alpha was one. The omega is all. The alpha was Adam. The omega is everything that came forth out of his loins. And God's intent is to be all and in all. And if he's only all in the good thing, only all, then that's like you, let me tell you, let me, let me twist this up a little bit. If God will save only the good, then I have the right To be faithful to him only when I have good time. And when my suffering comes and when all hell breaks loose and I don't have all the provision that I need, I can go ahead and leave him. Since God only deals with good people, then I might as well only worship him in good time. But I am required to worship him at all times because all things are from him. Why must I worship him when all hell breaks loose? Because he's in the hell. Why must I worship him when things are going wrong? Because those things that are going wrong will make me stronger. Why must I worship him when I'm hurt, betrayed, let down, and failed by people in my life? Because ultimately those people were put there to make me stronger, so I must bless them. And therefore God looks down into the earth and says, if I only save the good, then I am only a God of the good, which means I'm not a God of the all. I'm a God of the all, and therefore the wickeder that some people are, the greater that it makes me. And don't you worry about it. It's God's issue. It's not your issue. It's God's plan. It's not your plan. It's God's world. It's God's church. God's creation. So, if this is true, Psalms 90 verse 3, 1 through 3 will really mess us up. So why don't you just go ahead and go there. This is going to get me in big trouble. But that's all right. Psalms 90, verse 1. Here's a psalm for you. I would like to get the verse, Psalms 91. You better read Psalms 90. We always like to dwell in the secret place. But here's a good verse 1. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Which let me help set you free right there. 
Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. I wonder if you all hear what the Spirit is saying. In other words, before I was born in this flesh, the Lord was my dwelling place. This body is not my dwelling place. See, before I had an earthly existence, I had a heavenly existence in him. The Lord has been my dwelling place. In past generations, when God made Adam, I was there. I was in him. When God gave Moses the law, I was there. I was in him because he has been my dwelling place in all generations. And after I leave this earth, he will still be my dwelling place in all generations. As long as there's a generation, the Lord is our dwelling place. The Lord is our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth. Or even thou hast formed the earth and the world everlasting from everlasting thou art God. Verse 3. Here we go. You turn men to destruction and then say, return ye children of men. It is God who turns men to destruction and then tells them, come on back to me. And that mess you up. What do you do with that? Where, where, where do you go? Where do you go with that one when you're saying that nothing bad happens from God? If there's something bad happening in your life, it's because of the lack of faith. Huh? Because of the presence of sin? Huh? Because you're out of the will of God? Whatever is happening in my life is not happening because of lack of faith, because I'm out of his will, or because I did something wrong. It's happening because he put my feet on the path. And when he's ready for me to change, all he has to say is, return. And all of the preaching and tired tracks and Pitiful altar call won't bring a man back to the altar till God says, return. And our job is to love them and make them feel comfortable and invite them and welcome them and keep them here so that when God says return, there'll be someone there who can help them come back. But we say you're not well. If you ain't living right, if you ain't holy, if you're not living the right lifestyle, you get out into your mean business with God. Until you're ready to get serious, you get out of the church. Listen to me. Jesus said, I'm not sent to the well. I'm sent to the sick. You show me a church where every but is righteous and I'll show you a brainwashed cult. Give me a church filled with folks that are messed up. People whose lives are ruined. People who ain't ready to change. And I'll keep preaching to them until the Lord says return. Because it's His church. It's His people. And only He has the power to save. The Lord turns them to destruction and then He tells them to return. Which is another message. I may have to preach it in Duluth. The Lord who turns the steps of a righteous man ordered by God. But your righteousness is not determined by how you live. Your righteousness is determined by the work that he's done. So the mistake that a righteous man makes in my path, my step was ordered. Why did I do this, God? Because I turned you to destruction. Someone says you're giving people a license to sin. No, you're not. No matter how you preach, people want to sin, they're going to sin. You preach against sin all day long. They won't do it. Nothing's changed in the church. No matter what you preach from one extreme to the next. Or from, you show me a church where they preach hard holiness. I'll show you just as many teen pregnancies. I'll show you just as much homosexual. I'll show you just as much drug abuse. I'll show you just as much self-righteousness. I'll show you just as much abusive, adulterous relationships. I'll show you abusive husbands, abusive children. I'll show you everything there just like any other place. 
Nothing different. There's no difference. There's not any less in one place than there is in another. It's the grace and mercy of God that brings men when he's supposed to bring them. Could you imagine Abraham? When Abraham had Ishmael, we've always preached, Abraham brought forth Ishmael, Ishmael as a child of the flesh, God, Abraham missed God, and now for the, and then you know how Lindsay just eats that up, and that's why the Ishmaelites, the Arab nations, are constantly fighting with the Israelites. So we create another false doctrine to justify warfare and murder, to build our army so that we can defend Israel and kill a bunch of innocent people because they believe differently than us. We justify the murder of Muslim nations in the name of our God, and yet we condemn Catholicism. But for every right-wing preacher that preaches the restoration of Israel, they also preach the, the armament of Israel and the building of American forces to defend Israel in the time of war because America's going to come and defend her in that great Armageddon. And millions of people are going to be slaughtered that have never even heard the gospel. Oh, how proud and righteous are we. It is God who turns men to destruction. And it was God who turned, who took Ishmael from Abraham, not as an afterthought, as a before thought. God didn't ask that Abraham had Ishmael said, oh, well, maybe I'll use him now that he made a mistake. God always intended Abraham to birth an Ishmael because he knew that the only way Isaac could live and Isaac's grandson Joseph was thrown in the pit and getting ready to be killed by his own brothers. A hairy band of Ishmaelites came along and God took the generational seed of Abraham and Hagar and saved the seed of Isaac by what you and I have called one man's mistake. God turned him to destruction and then God took his turn. Listen to what it says. He turns men to destruction and then he says to, to or he, he, he turneth man to destruction and he says, return ye children of men. This is why, let me deal with this part. Here's a good verse for you. Romans 8 and 20 says, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who subjected the same in hope. By reason of him who subjected the same in hope, the creature was made subject to empty beauty. The creature was made subject to the, to, to the path that it walked. It was made, it, the creature, creation, had no choice. Creation doesn't have a choice. You don't have options, man. Somebody says, how do I know if I'm in the will of God? I said, where are you? Well, I'm right here. That's where you're supposed to be. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. What are you doing? Nothing. And that's what you're supposed to be doing. I'm called to preach. No doors being open for me. Shandai. <laughs> Subject to frailty. Subject. Condemned to frustration. The creature is condemned to frustration because it is always constantly trying to figure out the mind and the will of God. Not voluntarily. It did not volunteer to be. None of us volunteered to be in this life or to walk this walk or to live this life or to walk this path. None of us so readily volunteered. For this. We were made subject to this frustration by reason of him who subjected us in hope. And all of creation groans and moans within itself to be delivered from this corruption and this bondage. Now, the Greek word for iniquity, or the Hebrew word is avon, which means perversity. But the Greek word anomia means lawlessness. Anomia means to be lawless or to be without restraint. Restraint is only necessary Based on knowledge of right and wrong. You remove the knowledge, you remove the restraint. Are you listening to me? So what happens, we, we all read the verse where there's no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. 
So your vision is your covering. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he, we forget to finish the passage. He that lives within the restraint, or he that lives within the level of the law, or the level of the law, happy is he. Happiness is meant when you live within the law. You know why you're not happy? Because you don't perceive the law. You know why you're miserable? Let me tell you why you're miserable. Because you don't perceive the law. Let me help you for a minute. I'm getting quiet. Where there's no vision, the people perish. Happy is the man that keepeth the law. Happy is the man that does not walk in lawlessness. Happy is the man that understands that from the moment he was created, God had already purposed everything in his life. Happy is the man that knows there is nothing going on in his life that God did not order. Happy is the man who realizes whether up or down, he is right where God wants him. Whether rich or poor, he is right where God wants him. Whether blessed or cursed, he is right where God wants him. Happy is the man who does not beat himself up every day because he keeps feeling like I'm making mistakes and messing up. Happy is the man who says, this is where God wants me. Happy is the man who says, everything that has ever happened to me had to happen to me. Happy is the man who does not need to go to a promise keepers conference to get healed deep down on the inside because somebody abused him 10 years ago. Happy is the man who looks back at the person that abused him and says, bless you. You had to abuse me because I need to help other folks that are abused. I ain't going to sit here wallowing. I don't need no tissues. Don't bring me no box to keep your tired Kleenex to yourself. I ain't crying. I'm not snotting in this church. I'm going to stand up like a man and I'm going to take responsibility and say I am right where God wants me. I don't need your tired, charismatic, shallow pat on the back saying it's going to be all right. I thank God for the promise keepers and I thank God for the promise breakers. Because all of them have made me who I am today. I'm going to start a promise breakers conference. I'm going to get all the hellions in my life. I'm going to have a conference for all of them. Because I just want to bless (laughs) y'all. I am who I am because of every promise you broke. And you were supposed to break them so you don't have to be condemned. Don't feel guilty. Don't feel bound. You have to do it. I'm a better man for it. I ain't blaming you. As a matter of fact, I'm anointed today because of you. You know why we have an issue of forgiving? You know why it's hard for us to forgive? You know why? It's hard for us to forgive because we want to blame somebody. It's not the issue of forgiveness. We just want to blame somebody. If I forgive you, then that means I can't use you as an excuse anymore. If I forgive you, then I got to take responsibility for me. You don't want to forgive anybody. Because we want, we don't, we want To always have someone to blame. You're the reason I'm like this. I'm the reason. He's the reason I'm like this. Get mad, get mad with him. C.S. Lewis, one of the greatest Christian writers, also an Anglican. Oh, actually Catholic. You didn't know that. I'll never read his book again. C.S. Lewis said, The greatest gift that God gives us is the gift to be ourselves. Charles Rutherford said, another great scholar, Charles Rutherford said, a man cannot change till he first accepts who he is as a gift. We want people to change by telling them you were never like that. Huh? 
have a problem with me because you couldn't come to one of my counseling classes because I don't preach Freudian psychology. Somebody comes, a husband and wife come to my office and they say, well, we have a problem. My husband's an adult. He's been committing adultery, but I know that's not him. And I want him to change. First of all, I said, that is him. The reason he committed an adultery is because he's an adulterer. If that's not him, you wouldn't be here. Father, I just don't know why my daughter lied. She's not a liar. If she ain't a liar, she would have never lied. Your daughter lies because she's a liar. And if she won a lie, she's a liar now because she told a lie. You're not in my office because she has the potential to lie. She lied. You're not in the office because I'm worried my husband has the potential to commit adultery. You're here because he did commit adultery. Now, the first issue is that he has to admit you did it. You are an adulterer. By playing Pentecostal pansy games. I'm not. Yes, you are. Now, let's deal with the issue from there. Now, you want to change. Maybe you don't want to change. Maybe you enjoyed it. Stop playing spiritual games now. Let your wife know now instead of making her miserable. Instead of me giving you a nickel dime trying to protect my reputation that I've never dealt with a divorce in my church, you need to be a man and confess to your wife the reality of the relationship. Do you want to save it or don't you want to save it? Don't, you know what? People live in our churches to please pastors and they're making themselves miserable to please, lead, to, to please leadership. You're not happy. Let's make a, let, let's make an adult decision. Let's deal with this issue and let's go on. Before you bring your wife home, some disease, playing some Pentecostal game, trying to be God's perfect person, hypocrite. I'm in trouble. I ain't got but two offerings. This whole message. I should do better than that. Thank you. Amen. Somebody loves me. <laughs> Listen. Now, why am I saying that? Am I saying then you're supposed to just, you're supposed to just let people do whatever they want? They don't do it. You don't let them. They do it. We preach against adultery, but people still do it. We preach against fornication, people still do it. We preach against lying, people still do it. So let's stop playing spiritual Superman and Wonder Woman and realize that there are real issues in people's lives. And we've got to get to the root of the matter. And you don't get to the root of the matter trying to play a facade and make everybody think that your church is the perfect church. There is no perfect church. There is no perfect church at all. So there are issues, there are problems, there are things that need to be dealt with. And the way you deal with them is by owning up to them and admitting this is an issue. And sometimes admitting I ain't ready to be delivered. I'm kind of enjoying this. You know, one thing about David, one thing I love about the Psalms, is David was never theologically correct. But David prayed his heart. He prayed the way he felt. He felt comfortable enough with God to say... Dude, this is the way I feel. No, it ain't right, but this is just the way it is. You ain't never going to get the... If you want to be changed from something, you're never going to be changed by telling God, set me free, and in your heart you're saying, you're making the next day. <laughs> Sometimes you need to be truthful with God and say, I don't want to be set free. I'm really enjoying myself. And I'm telling you, because when you're ready for me to return, you'll tell me. And you know what that does? First of all, that takes the authority away from me. It lets me know I'm not God's spiritual policeman. Which many of us want. We want men to abuse us as leaders over our life to tell us everything to do. But first of all, when you preach this truth, it removes the authority from me and puts it right back where it belongs, which is on you. And which puts it right back where it belongs, which is on God. Because we are only under shepherds of him, the great shepherd. When he says return, you'll return. And that's the knowledge of the glory of God. And you can counsel people till the cows come home. 
And that is not going to change their life until God speaks to them and says it's time. Then it's going to be time. Does that mean we deal with it? Does that, what does that mean? Does it mean when a couple comes into our, our office and they say, hey, I'm committing adultery, you just allow it? No, it doesn't mean that you allow it. But it means that you make him all up to it and you make him stop playing spiritual Pentecostal games and say what he's really thinking and not say what he thinks his wife or the pastor wants to hear him say. And we play this game that we always say what people want us to hear, but we don't say what's really in our heart. Amen. We got to move beyond that. All right. So where there's no vision, the people perish. He that keepeth the law, he's happy. He that walks where God has placed him to walk, that man is happy because he understands he's right where God wants him to be. And that is the process. Well, I've been condemned. You know why people hate us Catholics and Orthodox? You know why they hate us? Because people, here's, this is, I always talk to people and they say, what is your real issue with Orthodoxy? Well, y'all can do whatever you want. And think, just go to confession and it's fine. And? That's a bad thing about us? A bunch of, yeah, all you got a bunch of whoremongers and adulterers and alcoholics. Y'all don't live right smoking and sipping and dipping and flipping and tripping and... And that's a bad thing? And these people just go to your churches are packed with these kind of people. What do you mean? Every time I tell my dog, my boxer, to do something, and she doesn't understand the command, because she's stupid, but anyway, I say, fetch. And she... so that's some of the people in the church are, you know. You just give them a Scooby snack and send them on their way. Bless you. Go on. Well, I'm bothering with you. Get a box of Scooby snacks and put it up at the altar. You didn't get that. Here, have a snack. Here. The reality of that is this, though. And, and we get condemned for that, that people can come to a priest and hear the words, you are forgiven. Come to a bishop and hear the words you are forgiven. And yet Jesus says, whoever sins you remit, I'll remit. Whoever sins you retain, I will retain. He doesn't say whoever you counsel, I'll remit their sin. He says, if they come to you and say, I need to be forgiven, then forgive. He didn't say, whoever you sign up for a 13-week process of counseling and before you give. He says, whoever sins you retain, I'll retain. Whoever sins you remit, I remit. And just in case that power goes to your head and you begin to wield it like the Pope, Here's another verse for you. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive our trespassers. Remember, for every person that has offended you, you have offended somebody. Whoo, I'm in trouble. Matthew 7, 22, I'm almost finished. Oh, it's early, it's only 12. This is the Feast of Transfiguration. That's a long service in the Orthodox Church. I'm just chanting the Trisagion right now. We haven't even started, sir. What did I say I was going? Where? Matthew 7? Yeah, I'll chant that one there. Kadisho. Aloha. I can kind of do it like a rap. Hey, go, prophet, go. Matthew seven twenty two. Listen to what it says about lawlessness. Many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, we have not, we have, prop, uh, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have we cast out devils and in thy name have we done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Depart from me. Those of you who were lawless, depart from me. Listen to why he doesn't, listen, watch this church. The miraculous is not the issue of the kingdom. We have built movements on the miraculous. We have built movements on the issue of the name. 
Listen to what Jesus says. There's many who said, I did this in your name, that in your name. Jesus isn't concerned about his name. He's not concerned about the miraculous. He's concerned, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. I never knew you because you thought that what you were doing was based on your merit and not mine. You thought that the miraculous was the evidence of the kingdom of God. You thought that what you did determined relationship with you. Notice the one thing they never did, though, in his name. They never forgave sin. They cast out devils. They healed the sick. But they never administered his nature. They were lawless. They did. How many people in the end of time are going to be cast out from his presence or cast out from the fullness of their glory, the full potential that they have because they did the work of God but never ministered his nature? Now watch what the mystery of iniquity is because this is very important because we're seeing this here. Why won't he know them? Because they were not within the confines of the divine order for proper fulfillment. They did not walk out a daily life. It acknowledged him in everything. They thought only the miraculous was God. Are you listening to me? It is not that you can attribute his name only to healing, but also to, to infirmity. I just lost you. It's not that you say, if I'm healed from the cancer or die from the cancer, it is the Lord. This generation of people says, it is only the Lord if he heals. They only give his name to healing. And God says, you forget. I make some vessels to honor and other vessels to dishonor. Are you listening to me today? Can we, can we go a little further? So we all know that the mystery, what the mystery of iniquity is. We've talked about it over and over and over. Or what we don't know it yet. I'm, I'm trying to help you to understand what it is. The mystery of iniquity makes its appearance first in the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden. The Bible says man ate. Man became lawless. God gave him a rule. One, The one rule God gave him, he broke. Why did God tell him not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Because as long as man did not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, then it was God who determined what was right and wrong, not man. See, the moment man ate, then God gave man a law according to man's heart. The law that God gave is not God's law. The law that God gave is your law. The thing that condemns you is you, not God. The thing that you're beating yourself up is your voice in your heart, not God's voice from heaven. Because the moment man began to know good and evil, then everything that man said, hmm, I think that's evil, God says, I'll give you a law. Man looked at a pig wallowing in the mud. Man says, I'm, ah, that's kind of nasty. God says, well, then don't eat it. Did you just catch that? Well, then don't eat it. There's a law because your heart is defiled. My God, look at that catfish eating the mud from the bottom of the... Don't eat it. There's another law. Everything that's in your heart, I'll give you a law according to. And God built a law based on men determining what's right and wrong. God says, I never wanted man to do that. That was my job. Because if I determined what was right and wrong, then I could also minister according to those things. So even if men transgress something, then I could immediately forgive them because of their ignorance. You don't smack a little child that does not know that something's wrong. You educate it. Amen? Now, they keep doing it. Pray loud, pray loud. <laughs> So, when they partook, when Adam and Eve ate of the tree of knowledge, what happened? They died. They lost life. They died in that day, within a thousand year period of time they died. The thief coming not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. To destroy, to bring death, to bring destruction. That's why the thief cometh not. Let me help you folks. I think I said this before, but I'll say it again. The thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Let me say that again. A thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, 
and to destroy. One more time. A thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus said, I come as a thief in the night. Thief coming not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. It is the Lord who says that I make alive and I make dead. It is the Lord who says I turn men to destruction and then I say restore. It is the Lord who gave a man a talent and when he did nothing with it, took it from him and then locked him up. I'm trying to show you that I serve a great big God and not a little bitty devil. I'm trying to show you all that God is doing everything and nothing is being done that's blowing God's mind. You know, now, what is, some, I know some of you are kind of confused. You say, why are you saying all this? Because the church has got to stop feeling like they're God's policemen. Like it is their responsibility to make everybody right. The church has got to preach the love of God, unconditional love. Unconditional love. They must preach it, they must be it, they must love it, they must see it, they must become what God is, they must unconditionally love and let God do the rest. Our job is to love. Our commandment is to love. Our the only way he says you'll know them, he did not say you'll know them because they cast out devils, they raise the dead, they heal the sick. He says you know them by the love that they have one for another. You know The identifying quality of my church is love. Now, it is impossible to love if you think that people are doing things by their own will. But when I get through preaching this message, you're going to say, well, now it's easier for me to love these people because I realize it ain't them. What you did to me I don't have an issue with you. If I got an issue, it got to be with God. Because God turned you to destruction. And God didn't tell you to return. Now that's delivering, isn't it? All right. So what happens is that the mystery of iniquity works in us. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. Second Corinthians says every man's work. You know what we're going to be judged by? Our work. Not sin. Bible never says he's going to judge sin. He's going to judge the work. Every man's work shall be tried in the fire. The refiner's fire refines the work that you do. Are you listening to me? We think it's what you do. No, it's the work that you do. Did you love unconditionally? Did you bring them into the... Did you feed the hungry? Did you clothe the naked? Did you manifest the divine nature? That's the work that we do. And our work is going to be tried in the fire. Not what we do, but how we treat others. How we minister to other people. How we manifest the kingdom and the ministry of Jesus Christ is what's going to be tried. And there are people who are thinking that I have lived a perfect life, therefore I have nothing to fear. The fires of the refining presence and nature of God will refine you, will purify you, and will eradicate that that you built with wood, hay, and stubble. That that is not built in the eternal, that that is eternal. There is only one thing that is eternal. And that is love. Because now abideth these three, faith, hope, and charity. These are the things that abide. But the thing that will abide, which is the greatest forever, is love. Because God is love. Love is the very nature and presence of God. Anything less than that has nothing to do with God. Are you listening? Let me finish now. In conclusion... No, 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 no. So, God has some profound work He's doing in us, in the work that He's doing in the church, and the work that He's doing in, uh, in our life, whatever He's doing in your life today, the mystery of iniquity, the mistakes, the, the small, the things that, where you've missed God, understand that God is in it. You've gotta understand what God is trying to do. Your job is not to beat yourself up, your job is to understand why, now, what is God trying to say? See, let me tell you why most of us never really are able to stop doing certain things. 
Because what we do is we beat ourselves up over what we did and we never try to identify why and what God was trying to accomplish in us when we did it. So what we have to do is identify the work of God and not our work. See, again, let me tell you something. It, it's the same on both sides. Let me break this down for you, Mark. You're like this. If Mark gets up and sings, and I mean the Holy Ghost comes through and pe- knock people out, they're all swinging from the, the, the flags. Okay? And Mark walks off and says, I am a bad worship leader. Oh man, I need to tell the pastor, I need to, it's time for a raise. I need some more money, cause I'm bad. I'm, I could be working for, I, let me, where's Rod Parsley's phone number? He needs to hear me. Then what he just did, is instead of giving the glory to what God was doing, he stole the glory by identifying himself with the work. It is the same, the same law is applicable on all levels. If I make a mistake and instead, look what I did. I failed God. I messed up. I've let God down. Then I have stole his glory again. Instead of saying, why now? What are you trying to say to me? I would live holy. I want to live right. But for some reason, something pulls me. What are you trying to tell me? What are you trying to say to me? Why am I doing this? What is the message in the mess? How many of you hear that by the Holy Ghost? <laughs> <laughs> Next month there'll be a tape series on Prepare for War. And this week in Prepare for War by Apostle Paul Shell. <laughs> the message in the mess. So <laughs> Jesus, let me say this. When Adam ate from the tree of knowledge and good and evil, here's something very important for you to understand. Let me deal with this. Adam ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, correct? Lamb of God was slain when? Foundation. Before there was a need, there was a sacrifice. Calvary was not plan B, it was plan A. God made the lamb and then made the man. Are you listening to me? So the lamb was slain. Before there was a sickness, he had already had a cure. I wonder if you hear me here. Before there was iniquity in a fall, he had already planned a redemption. There is a purpose in the working of the mystery of iniquity. See, the whole reason that Adam ate. See, we teach that Adam ate and man fell. But there was a something pushed man to eat. Something was inherent in man that made him want to eat. What was inherent in man that made him want to eat? The need that the lamb was made manifest. That uh, The purpose that the lamb had already done a work. The lamb was born to save, but there was no one to save. The lamb was born to save, but there was no one to save. So Adam ate because the lamb needed to save someone. And so the mystery of of iniquity that was in Adam was that God needed to save somebody. Are you listening to me? So when you make a mistake, if you're a homosexual, don't beat yourself up. God needed the church to know that some homosexuals he still loves. And if you ain't fully delivered yet, don't beat yourself up. God wants the church to know he can love you even in your mess. And if your marriage fell apart, God doesn't want you to be yourself up over it. He wants to be able to save a messed up marriage. And if you're no good and you got a cousin lying mouth, he wants the church to know he can save those people too. Because he wants to be God all in all. Somebody had to be a homosexual because he wanted to save one. All in all, somebody had to lie. He had to save one. All in all, somebody had to kill somebody. He wanted to save one. All in all. (laughs) 
The cure, the cure, the cure is only as powerful as the infirmity. The cure is only as powerful as the infirmity. The cure becomes more famous by the deadliness of the infirmity. Somebody invented aspirin. It heals a headache. When somebody gets a cure for cancer, they'll get more glory because the infirmity is worse than a headache. So the mystery of iniquity is working. It is driving men to perversity. It is driving men to murder. It is driving men to extreme acts that God may find the worst of them all and save them that he may be glorious. If he saves your nickel dime self, you ain't never did nothing. He's God. He gets a little testimony out of it. But when he saves those who have been down and nothing and no good and derived and nobody wants to be bothered with him, God gets a, boy, you talking about a praise. You let a drug dealer come up in here that's been murdering and killing and gangbanging. Let him come to the altar. You talking about a testimony. They're all quiet. There ain't no words on the wall. I'm safe. Let's get into trouble here. Second Chronicles 32 verse 31. I'm going to read some of these things quickly so you need to move with me quickly. Second Chronicles 32 verse 31 says, How be it God left him to try him that he might know what is in his heart. God left him. God did not only seemingly left him, he left him that he might know what's in his heart. Some of the stuff you're going through is that God may purify your heart. It cannot be, del- it cannot be taken from you till it rises to the surface. The mystery of iniquity brings stuff up and out so that when the manifestation of the sons of God comes, when we come into the fullness of our glory, God does not have to deal with these issues now. He deals with these issues now so that he don't have to deal with them then. Had Jimmy Swagger dealt with that stuff when he was younger, and purge it out of him instead of playing spiritual Superman and keeping it in him. If he had gotten it out of him when he became a great man of God, it would have never arisen. It arose because he went to a Pentecostal church that instead of telling him to deal with the issue, told him just hide it. That's why you need to have a relationship with your kids where they can come tell you anything. Not where they're scared to talk tell you what they're dealing with or what issues they're dealing with. You want your kid to come tell you anything. You want your kid to come tell you. You know, I'm thinking about trying pot. Because you can raise them as good as you want to. You want them to be able to tell, tell them that so that you can share with them what the trials you've been through and you can share with them out of your heart. But if they keep that thing bottled up, they're going to go do it. And then when your kid, with you out you knowing it, it dies from an overdose because you were so hard-headed that you would have told them to hide it rather than confess it, at least you know doesn't mean that they're not going to do it because they tell you and you're going to be able to talk them out of it. At least now there's a constant communication so that when God says return, they can at least come to their parents instead of having to go to some conference. I know people don't like this, but it don't matter. Because it's the Feast of Transfiguration. So he is exposing man to himself. What is God doing? God is showing you you. The mystery of iniquity is showing. You know what I think? A righteous man. A righteous man falls seven times. Hear me. A righteous. He orders the step of the righteous. So each time a righteous man fell, it's because it was ordered. Now you ain't gonna get this on TBN. You ain't gonna get this on TBN because I'm not gonna get a poodle perm. I 
identifying factor. Before you can speak in TBN, they say, do you have how many chemicals? <laughs> Amen. Chemicals. <laughs> the chemicals are ordained by God. Amen. Especially when they have a Guinness label on them. I'll receive that from Jesus. First Corinthians eleven nineteen says. First Corinthians eleven nineteen chemicals are ordained by God. We accept that. Amen. The chemical reaction in a fine Cabernet Sauvignon is ordained by God. First Corinthians eleven. 19 says, For there must also be heresies among you, that they which are approved may be manifest among you. For there must also be heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Did you just read that? Not that they which are not approved. They which are approved. Heresy is not there to show us who's wrong. Heresy is there that we identify the right. Do you hear what Paul says? Paul says, do not spend time trying to identify the wrong. Find the right. Don't, uh, he ain't got it. She ain't got it. No. Identify those that have it and connect in covenant. But what the church does is they identify the wrong. You ain't right and you ain't right. And you ain't right, and you ain't right. So I got a church with a thousand folks. This, you know, a hundred ain't right, and the nine hundred got to starve every Sunday because every Sunday I got to deal with the hundred. That don't even work in a secular classroom. In a secular classroom, if a student doesn't know something, you continue to teach. The class, because if the majority knows it, and then you take special time for the other one. But you don't go out of your way, and you don't stop the whole class, and in a main class, try to identify. You keep teaching truth. You keep teaching it because most of them understand it. And those that don't understand it, they'll get it, or they'll take it next year. And they'll keep taking it till they pass. But you don't stop teaching the class and fail the whole class, because two or three folks don't get it. You keep teaching it. And Jesus did not show down all 12 of the apostles because one didn't get it. So he kept the one with them. And when it was time for the one to mess up, he let them do what he did and said, that that you do, do quickly. But the rest I'll continue to feed. The rest I'll continue to empower. And the church has kept us blind and ignorant and illiterate and hungry and erectic. Come on now. Bulimic because we have desired truth and instead we're still getting John 3.16. All right, I'm almost finished. Thank you. And may I say you're looking quite snappy today, old shop. <laughs> Isaiah 66, verse 4. Here's a verse that'll mess you up. I like this one. 66. Verse 4. I got a, I'm not an old rust. Here's verse 4. And I will also choose their delusions. And I will bring their fears upon them. Because when I called, none did answer. And when I spake, they did not hear. But they did evil before my eyes. And choose that in which I delighted not. Now the Lord says, I'm going to put a delusion on them. Most of us would miss it. Most of us would not move in what God is trying to do because we're too busy trying to cast it. That's a spirit of delusion. Cast it out. Here's another verse for you. Jeremiah 2. Here's a good one. I like this one. You'll like this one too. Well, you probably won't, but I like it. Jeremiah, the second chapter. Here's a good one for y'all. Here's why the mystery of iniquity is why there's some stuff in our life that we got to deal with. Because we, you know, the truth is, do you want to be real or do you want to be you know, you just want to be a, put on a good show. Most Christians like to put on a good show. I want to be real. Listen to what Jeremiah 2.19 says. Your own wickedness shall correct thee. 
and your backslidings shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God and that thy, my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord God of hosts. This is what God says. God says everything you're, you're going to be corrected by you. God says I'm not going to correct you. Your mistake is going to correct you. If you change for me, you're not really changed. Until you see it enough in you till you want to make the change. Most of us change because we are afraid of what people think of us. And therefore, we do not truly change. We do not truly change until we change because we have made the decision that we're through. And that's why it's not fair for the church to force change because you force a false change and you force people to live in hypocrisy. You must let God work it out in His time and His season so you have, you may have a church full of sinners, but at least you're not pastoring a church full of hypocrites. And I'll take a church full of sinners any day above a church full of hypocrites. As a matter of fact, that's what Jesus did. He hung out with sinners and he hated hypocrites. You Pharisees, you Sadducees, you who act righteous, but your heart is far from God. Give me the prostitute, the wine bibber, and the gambler, because at least that's who they are. It wasn't Mary Magdala trying to be a nun. It was Mary Magdala, a prostitute. That meant everybody knew who she was. Jesus did not talk with the woman of Samaria who was trying to be a wife. He was talking to the woman of Samaria. Samaria, who was too busy being a hooker, a hoochie mama. <laughs> Yo, hoochie, you better get delivered. It was Matthew, the tax collector. It was not Matthew. And it, you know, these men, everybody knew them. They were not faking anything. They came to Jesus just like they were. This is what I am. I like what you're saying. I want to hang out. Jesus didn't say, well, before you can hang out with me, you've got to change. Nowhere did he ever demand a change. He just said, come on, hang out with me. And his life compelled them to change. Can I suggest that when Mary Magdala was born, as a little girl, raised up in a poverty environment, her family not having enough money to sustain her, and not having the wealth to get her a husband in the Middle Eastern culture, not having enough money to get her a dowry, which forced her into prostitution. Can I say something extreme and strange? It was the Lord who made her family poor, so that this woman would demean herself to become a prostitute. So that when God came in the flesh and Mary Magdala saw him, her spirit remembered that she made a covenant with God from the beginning. That I would suffer this degradation so that when you come, you can save me a prostitute that other generations may know. Jesus ain't tripping over your man. Are you hearing me? So that people go through things because God says, I've allowed the mystery of iniquity to work in you and it shall reprove you. When I call you to return, you'll return. It has nothing to do with what you think or who you say or anything like that. Now, let's finish this here. In the book, let me go to First Kings. You don't have to turn there. Chapter 22, verse 20 to 23. I want to read it in its entire First Kings, uh, chapter 22. I want to read this for you because you won't believe it unless you hear it. Here's something that will mess you up. We know that the Bible says that God cannot lie. God is not a man that he should lie. The Bible says in 1 Kings 22, verse 20 through um, 23. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that may, he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner, and another said on that manner. And they came forth the st spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all of these prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil 
concerning thee. The Lord put a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophet. God didn't lie. See, he still put the lying spirit in the mouth. He still initiated it. What I'm trying to show you folks is that God, you know, we have to mean God that he can only do some stuff. He can do whatever he wants to get his will. If God has to give you a false prophecy to put you somewhere that his will may be glorified, he'll do that. If, if, if he's got to, to allow something to go wrong in your life, to reposition you, to get you where you need to be. He can do that. The devil works for him, not against him. The devil's on his payroll, folks. The devil is on his payroll. When God, and the Bible says in the book of Job, when God was meeting with the sons of God, Satan was among them. When God was meeting with the sons of God, Satan was among them. Huh. God was meeting with the sons of God. Satan was among the sons of God. Getting his assignment from God. Doing only what God told him to do. Satan did not try to undermine God. He did only what God commanded him to do. If he could undermine God, God's not God. You say, well, now you're saying that you're glorifying the devil. No, I'm not. He ain't nothing but a chump. He ain't nothing but a Rottweiler on a choke chain. He does what God tells him to do. And when God's through, he yokes him back. He says, sit, boy. Every time you get out of line, he gets that Rottweiler. <laughs> you get back in line, he says, okay, good boy, sit. Have a Scooby snack. Are you hearing me? Verse 2 Thessalonians, back where we started. Listen, you want to hear strong delusion again? Here's another verse of Messiah. And I'm finishing right now, I swear. I promise. I really am. I'm just taking my... I'm enjoying this. You know, I like this. I love killing religious spirits because I want the people of God to walk out of here and say and, and stop beating... You know, you're, you're, you are your own worst enemy. I want you to become delivered and not beat yourself up for the things in your life that, that you're saying, you know, I'm a prisoner of this, I did this, and you constantly feel like you have to reap what you sow. And your whole life you're feeling like you're still reaping for something you did years ago. You know, I look up in the face of God and say, you know, you did it. Your mess, your problem, your issue. You know? Abba Anthony says to one of his spiritual sons in the sayings of the Desert Fathers. He's walking with several monks through the village and a woman comes running through the village naked with no clothes on at all. And all of the monks, as is according to the custom, un turn their face immediately so that they do not see her nakedness and shame or compromise their vows. And Abba Anthony, who is a great spiritual father, stands there staring and gazing at this naked woman. And all of the monks amazed at the impropriety of their spiritual father say, how can you, an abbot and a father of, of a monastic community in Syria, how can you look on this woman who is naked? Abba Anthony looks and says, was there a naked woman? I didn't see a naked woman. I was beholding the glory of God. So the pure all things are pure. To the defiled, all things are defiled. If it's in you, it'll come out of you. If it's not in you, you have nothing to worry about. Somebody told, you know, in the Orthodox Church, we let people kind of just do whatever they want. We don't have all the issues. Not we have a standard. But not like you all do. You know, you won't let people go nowhere. And so they, you know, people in my church come, you know, 
They'll tell you in a minute. Why are you late to the liturgy this Sunday? Well, you know, I was out at the club last night. I'm sorry, Bishop. Not in your churches, you'd kick them out. But I hear this from my priest. <laughs> and so, some of you would kick them out of the church and, and you said, well, why, you know, and then I always ask Pentecostals or Charismatics, well, why don't you let people go to the clubs? Well, because it's a place full of sin and, and, and you know, it's, uh, they're grinding on each other, dancing all nasty and dirty, doing the dirty dancing and all that nasty stuff. And I'm thinking, you think a nightclub will bring that out of them? Nothing can bring something out of you that's not already in you. Now, you gotta put a bunch of restrictions if you don't train, teach the people. If you don't let the mystery of iniquity work in their life, then you gotta put restrictions. But in our church, we let the mystery of iniquity work. We let God work it out in the life. And, and when God purges it, they can, you can give them all the freedom they want because when it's purged from their heart, there's nothing that can, the Bible says concerning Jesus, the prince of this world has come and he has found nothing in me. See, the reason we have to purge everything out of us so when the prince of the world comes, he finds nothing in us. And anyways, if it's in you, and you don't deal with it, he'll grab it. That's why the mystery of iniquity brings it up. So that when the prince of the world comes, there's nothing. See, if the prince of the world comes and it's undealt with, then he has a legal right to devour. So God says, I've got something to counteract the attack of the devil. See, the devil uses sin, but God says... I can use sin also. The devil uses the flesh. God says, I can use the flesh also. The devil uses a lion spirit. God says, I can use it also. It's all mine anyway. It's mine. I created both good and evil. I created the waste to, to destroy. I created all these things. So the same thing that the devil would use to destroy you, God says, I'm going to use the same thing he was going to use to destroy you, to purify you, so that when he comes, there won't be nothing he can have in you. So I'm going to bring this thing up. I'm going to bring it it up so that you don't deal with it. I'm going to bring it up so I can purge it out of you before it becomes a monster. I'm going to bring it up so that you can identify it and deal with it. Deal with it. I'm going to bring it up so that you can work through it, process it, and become delivered so that when the prince of the world let me tell you something folks, what 95% what we're calling the devil is God trying to purge it out of us so that when the devil comes, he won't find nothing to deal with. Are you listening to me? Okay, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10 through 12, and then one more passage of Scripture, and I'm done. Amen. O oh, thou in all of Israel have I not found so great a faith. Second Thessalonians, verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. Huh? God shall send them a strong delusion that they would believe a lie. That's good. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth. Oh, that's kind of strong. But had pleasure... In unrighteousness. Next verse. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Who believe. The case is clear that they had pleasure in unrighteousness. They delighted in lawlessness. Iniquity worked freely in them. Therefore, God would send a strong delusion, or the word there actually is translated an inworking delusion. And there are two ways for us to come to salvation. Receive the love of the truth. To work into us into salvation or to receive an inworking delusion that we should be, believe a lie. There's two ways you're going to be saved. One or the other. Through truth or through a lie. What do you mean? Here. It is reported commonly among you that there's a man who committed fornication but not such as spoken among the Gentiles for he hath laid with his father's wife. But I, Paul, have already judged, though being absent in body, but present in spirit, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have turned him over to a strong delusion 
let this thing that he's let the sin that's in him, let it destroy him. Let it make him miserable in this earthly existence. Let him suffer through it. That in the day of the Lord Jesus, he will be saved. In other words, when people do not change, don't worry. Let them walk out their lifestyle. Let them give themselves to that sin. Don't try to change. You know what I promise? You know what we do? We continue to try to change them. If you've got to change, you've got to change. Paul says, oh, no, they don't. You've made your choice. Now give yourself to it. And it will, and God will use this iniquity to where you will become delivered from it because you will overindulge in an abundance of it. In other words, he'll give you so much you'll get sick from it and finally want to forget it. But you know what? This ain't worth it. He sends them both. And both can be used for his glory. Both can be used. Now, in true conclusion, Luke 22. In the true conclusion. In the concluding conclusion of the concludatory conclusion of the finishing last consummating omega, the end. Luke, the um, 22nd chapter. How many of you are learning something from this today? What I'm trying to do is get you to understand that the church has to be the church and we have to see that God is doing everything. All I'm trying to show you is a great big God. I'm trying to show you that the stuff that we continue to attribute to the devil, God says it's mine. That's the devil. God said it ain't him. He works for me. I did that. Why do you keep giving the devil all the glory? The devil had me under a spiritual attack. I said, that ain't the devil, that's me. I got you under a spiritual attack. Because you're hard-headed. So it says here in Luke, the 22nd chapter, 31st verse. So likewise, Luke 22, 31 rather. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that thy faith fail not. Now let me help you here, folks. There's a problem. Jesus did not say Peter, Peter. He said Simon, Simon. His name had already been changed to Peter. Peter couldn't be sifted. Simon could. The Christ nature in me has nothing to worry about. It is already saved. It is already righteous. It is already filled with glory. It is already sitting in heavenly places. But there's still a Baran. There's still an Adam nature here. Though my salvation is sealed, though I cannot lose what God has given me, there is still a flesh nature that I walk out daily. The processing is for my old nature. The mystery of iniquity already is at work. It's been at work from Adam. It works in the flesh nature. Now, the moment I came into the kingdom through baptism, God has already sealed that work. But it is God's will that not only is my spirit saved, thirtyfold, but also my will is saved, sixtyfold. But for those who walk in the hundredfold, they shall not die, but they shall also take their mortal bodies a hundredfold into the glory of the kingdom. So in order to take their body into the glory of the kingdom, Jesus says, I want to save the whole man, that you be sanctified holy. W-H-O-L-L-Y by the Holy Spirit so that the holy person is sanctified that all of you is separate now some of us we will not wholly be saved all men's spirits will be saved because the Bible says that the body returns to the dust and the spirit returns to God everyone will be saved in the spirit realm and some people like good conscious Righteous people or people that live morally good, their soul also will be saved because they have lived a morally correct life. 
But there is another group of people who not only spirit, 30-fold, soul, 60-fold, but a people who will take the defiled body of Adam and change it into the glorious image of Jesus, will be changed from glory to glory, that they may take even this body like Jesus took his body in a glorified form that they could walk through walls, walk on water, that the whole man may be saved. So those of you that want all of you to be saved, you've got to go through the mystery of iniquity so that he says not to the Christ nature, but he says to the Adam nature, Satan desires to sift you like wheat. But I prayed that your faith fail not. Now, some of us would have not in our chair. Who was us? I see Satan all over you. Come on, sit in the chair. Come on, folks, get around him. It's deliverance time. Sit him in the middle. Come on, pray. Come on, pray. We'd have a deliverance service. You'd be trying to cast the demon out. You'd be trying to cast the work of God out. You know why, why, why this church stopped this deliverance? They didn't even know why they stopped it, what God was doing. Because God was saying, you're casting me out 90% of the time. That's why I did. And I'll deal with that because there's no verse in the New Testament that justifies a deliverance ministry. There's not a deliverance. You show me in the Bible where it says deliverance ministry. It ain't in there. People have to go through things. There's sometimes you tell your children, tell your children, tell your children, and then you know you say, you know, go, you want to do it? Go do it. No. Don't touch it, that's hot. Don't touch it, that's hot. Don't touch it, that, mommy, that's hot. I don't want to touch that no more, and I don't remember that. Oh. You don't have to tell them, don't touch it, that's hot. You want, okay, go ahead. Some things you just gonna let them go ahead and work through it. <laughs> let the mystery of iniquity, have his way. Having a deliverance. Listen to what Jesus says. Listen to what Jesus says. But I have prayed that your faith fail not. I didn't pray that you don't go through it. Go through it. Peter, you need to deny me because it's in you. It's better that it comes out now than on the day of Pentecost when I need you to preach. It's better you deny me in front of one girl outside of the jail instead of in front of 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost. Something went wrong in your life. You need to thank God and say, Lord, at least you brought it out now. Because you could have let me become great and then bring it out and then destroyed me again. If you're letting this arise in my life now or in my marriage now or in my home now, it's because you want it purged out so we don't have to deal with it 10 years down the road. Some of you are wrestling with your marriages and things have been going, and you're saying why, and you're saying why are we at each other's throat, and why, why does it, you know why God's saying He's letting it go through now, rejoice. You, when you go home tonight, you need to look at your husband and wife, and the person you've been doing, and say, thank God. You know what? God must have great things in store for our marriage, because He could have waited for us to be married 30 years before we had to deal with this thing. Thank God that He trusts us enough to purge us out of our marriage now, so that we can last and remain, and we'll have something that'll be here at the end. I prayed that your faith fail not, and when you are converted, Go strengthen your brother. You folks, if you don't know how to swim, you can't help me when I'm drowning. If you ain't never been sick, your testimony does not affect me when I'm sick. You have got to have felt the pain that I'm feeling if you're going to help me move past it. 
God does not want great preachers. He wants people that can emote with other people. People that can feel. He doesn't need theologically correct people. He wants people who said, I've been there. I've felt your pain. I've dealt with the same thing you dealt with. I made mistakes, but he's still using me. I'm still anointed. I'm still preaching. I'm still casting out devils. I'm still raising the dead. And I ain't perfect. And I'm not so good. And I make mistakes and I probably will make more. But if he can use me, he can use you. And if he can anoint me, he can anoint you. And if he can ordain me, then he can ordain you. And that's the glory of the church. That when you are converted, when you work it out, then go find someone who's in the same problem you're in. And don't condemn them, but tell them, I've been where you've been. You know why the righteous fall seven times? So that the righteous never look down on anyone. You show me a man who's never fell, I'll show you a man who's not righteous. You know why he calls the righteous to fall? So that righteous go find other people who are fallen. Say, man, I've been right where you've been. I've dealt with it just like you dealt with it. The mystery of iniquity. I didn't understand it. But David said, it is good for me. That I've been afflicted. It's good for me. That I went through this hell. You know why David is every preacher's favorite person to preach about? You know why? Because David was a man just like us. David was a mess. And God still used him. Saul, one wife. Saul never murdered a man. Saul, good, righteous king. Saul did everything God told him. Faithful to his wife. Wasn't an adulterer. Wasn't a murderer. He was a morally good man. And God rejected him. And raised up a whoremonger. A murderer. A deceiver. And said the Messiah. Shall come. From your loins. David's grandmother. Was Rahab. A prostitute. His great grandmother was a prostitute. Great great grandmother was a prostitute. His grandmother was a Moabite, a product of an incestuous relationship. Jesus had Jesus didn't have skeletons in his closet, folks. He had a whole graveyard. That he would be identified with men at their weakness, that we could be identified with him in his strength. And Paul summed it up like this. When I am weak, then I am strong. The greater your fall, the greater your rise. The greater your destruction, the greater your restoration. The greater your mistake, the greater the process that God is bringing you back. The greater your compassion, the greater your elevation. I'm not telling you you have to go through these things. The mystery of iniquity doesn't say you have to do it. The mystery of iniquity says you should never look down on anyone and love them equally. The mystery of iniquity says I'm with you. Changed or unchanged. Saved or unsaved. Whether you come to my church or don't come. See, the, when you go out, see, that's the difference between this nickel dime witnessing you know, you know. Here's a track standing on the street. Here's a Jesus loves you. 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 It's not the kingdom of God. Come to my church. Come to my church. Come to my church. The kingdom of God is going where they are. It's going into the coffee house. It's going into the nightclub. It's going to the restaurant. And it's sitting down with them and identifying with them where they are. Oh, yeah, man, I love that group. That's all, yeah. Oh, man, have you heard this group? Too? Yeah, man, Marilyn Manson is awesome. But I, I like I like Marilyn Manson back in, you know, his golf days. I don't like all that glam now. I would never say that. That's why you'll never reach nobody. That's why your family still ain't saved. You can sit down 
with people right where they are and identify with them right where they are. When they hear that, and, you know, and, and then you know you've known them for months and, they, and you still ain't invited them to church. Most of the people who come to my church in Fresno have known me for months. And now they're coming and they didn't even know. I talk about spirituality. I talk about all kinds of stuff. Oh yeah, they, Buddhists. Oh yeah, we can talk about Buddha. Yeah, do you remember when Siddhartha said this, this, and this? Oh, oh, you know about the teaching of Siddhartha? Absolutely. And win them. And then finally somebody will see me and say, Your Eminence, how are you doing? They're looking at me. Your Eminence? What's up with that? Well, why didn't you ever tell me? Because it's not important. What's important is us. Oh, I want to go to your church. I bet your church is cool. I'm going. And people come. Build friendship with them. I go surfing. We surf all the time. We talk about our boards. We talk about different things. What do you like? Where do you surf? How many swells have you surfed this year? Have you been to Maui? Have you been to North Shore? When you're going to Australia, what's this? What's, you know, we talk to them. You meet. They never know. And then finally somebody finds out. And then, you, and then they say, hey, you've never condemned me. You've never downed me. They'll introduce you. This, this is the girl I live with. Oh, how cool. Awesome. Well, when y'all gonna cook dinner for me? Because you know the prophet got to get a meal. And I love to be fed. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sinner or no sinner. Jesus was always eating at sinner's houses. You see? Jesus is just like me. I know Jesus had a belly. I'm gonna paint an icon with Jesus with a belly. Because he is a eating somebody. Every time you see him in the Bible, he's eating. His last meal was, you know, the most important thing. Yeah. Do this in remembrance of me. Eat. Which means covenant isn't made across the pul pulpit. It's usually made across the table. The mystery of iniquity. Some of you are dealing with issues in your life. And you've been beating yourself up over it and said, man, am I ever going to be delivered from this? Absolutely. Am I ever going to be free from this? Absolutely. When? When God's will. Stop beating yourself up. If you don't know how, 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 I'm just trying to get through. I'm trying to walk it out. I'm trying to become delivered. When? When? When God's ready. And until then, you connect with other people that will love you through it. That's what the church is there to do. It's to love them through it when they come and say, I messed up again. That's all right. God won't reject you. It's okay. It doesn't matter how many times a, a child messes up. You, you keep, you may kick him out of your house, but you still love him. Listen to what Jesus says to Peter, and I'll finish with you. How many times should a man forgive, his, forgive someone who offends him? Seven times? Seventy times? How many? Jesus said seventy times seven. In other words, he's not actually giving a number. You know what he's saying? He's saying this. You forgive somebody as often as they need it. That means as often as they ask it. See, the danger, it's only dangerous when they stop asking. But as long as they ask, the church is commanded to give. As long as they say, can I be forgiven? Absolutely. The Lord absolves you of all of these things. Let them hear those words over and over and over again. In apostolic authority. Let, let them hear it over and over and over. Over and over and over. And when they hear that those words, that those, then they become delivered from their worst enemy. And so, for the first time they say, you know what, now I can begin to believe that God can forgive me. Because if you can, God can. If I can't believe you've forgiven me this many times. As many times as I've screwed up, I cannot believe you've forgiven me like this. And if you can do this earthly, whoa, well, God is greater than you. And then they say, you know what? I want to stop abusing this privilege. And then they want to stop doing it. Not because they're forced to. Just like the song that we sang. I used to think I had to. I used to think I should. 
The scripture told me that I should be good. But now I love because I want to. That's the whole key. You love because you want to. Now, God does not want you to be faithful because you have to. He wants you to be faithful because you want to. And that's a church that will change the world. That's what DF is. CKC is. It's a church that's going to change people not from preaching, but from living. Come any way you want. They can call this the church of anything goes. As that anything goes church. Absolutely. Anything goes. Because God will straighten it out when he's ready to straighten it out. The mystery of iniquity is working in all of us. Let me finish with this. This is very unique. Let me go back to, to the original text. Go back to the original text for one quick minute. Second Thessalonians. And I want to clarify this text for you. Because we think that talks about the Antichrist. But it doesn't. Of course not. My God, you need to be delivered. Listen to what it says. Second Thessalonians, where was seven, right? For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. In the King James Version, it says until he be taken out of the way, but the Greek word here is become. There is that which is becoming from your midst. So where it says that till he be taken away, it is actually reading, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only there is one who restrains you until he may become from the midst. And then shall be revealed the lawless one whom the Lord Jesus shall slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to naught by the manifestation of his presence. Right here. There's one that is becoming. Are you listening to me? It works. But there's something that's keeping it from having its full way. Until he may become from the midst. Who's restraining? Restraining us from become becoming it is the Adam nature that's in us that is becoming it is submitting to the working of God to the law that's in us watch this and it says in the last part with the breath of his mouth and bring to naught by the manifestation of his presence you know what we've been teaching that when the the one that's restraining is the Antichrist or well, we've been taught different things the Antichrist is going to restrain or that when the Antichrist is removed or, or the Holy Spirit is restraining actually the Holy Spirit is restraining when he's removed then that shall happen. Everybody's looking for something to take place. When the Antichrist comes, when this comes. But the only manifestation that the scripture talks about is the manifestation of the sons of God. So when it says that this work will be brought to naught by the manifestation of his presence, the manifestation of his presence is the church manifesting sonship. When you manifest as you are in the fullness of the glory of God, that that is restrained the world from becoming what it is, from all being saved. You know when all are going to be saved? When we are manifest. And everything that has hindered the world from coming to the fullness of glory will be done away with, with one breath of his mouth, with one fresh wind, one fresh wind that will come, one fresh, the word breath is translated ruach, or in the Greek pneuma, with the spirit. There shall come a spirit out of his mouth that shall, pers per it shall literally saturate the church. And when we're manifested, as we really are, you won't have to beg people to come to church. They'll see such the love of God in your life that they will long to come. You know why they don't come now? Because there's nothing that compels them to come. You know why they don't come now? Because there's nobody that will love them. They're scared of us. They are afraid of us. They're afraid of being hit. The world is like a dog who's been beat its whole life. And every time you raise your hand, even if you go to pet it, it still is scared. If you go, have you ever seen a dog that's been beat so bad that even if you try to pet it, it's scared away from you? And the church has beat people so much that even when you stretch out your hand in love, they shy away from us. They become angry and hateful and write songs and write things against the church. You know what? And I say this before, but I'll say it again. Marilyn Manson is the result of a perverted church. It's not the result of a perverted generation. The church made him what he is. He's nothing more than a shy dog that's been beat his whole life that now he doesn't even trust the loving hand. But when the church is manifest in the glory of God, that that is restrained will be taken away of and God will be all in all. You know why he can't be all in all right now? Because the church is not manifesting him. We are still dividing and designating saved, unsaved. 
worldly, not worthy, sinner, saint. But when we become delivered from all of those titles and we see God all in all, you know how you win people to church? You don't call them sinners. You tell them, you already have, you talk to them, you'd be surprised how much truth people have. And you build on that truth. That truth brings new truth. And that truth releases the fullness of the glory of God. Amen. Stand up on your feet. Father, in the name of Jesus, I stand as a priest and as a bishop in your church and as a prophet of God. And I decree absolution over every man, woman, boy, and girl that's here. I want them to hear the word that it is the Lord that forgives them. Their sins are forgiven them. Their sins are remitted. Holy things belong to the holy. More importantly than that, Father, the divine nature that's in them is now going to begin to manifest. Their families are waiting. Some of them have been waiting. Their friends are waiting for them to go. They're going to leave this place and tell some of their family who's been wrestling with issues or even some of themselves have been wrestling with things and say, you know what, you're right where God wants you. And when God's ready for it to change, it'll change. When God's ready for it to come together, it'll come together. When God's ready for it to be perfect, it'll be perfect. God, there is a love being made manifest in this church the like of which has never been seen before. And the growth that is promised here will come not through great meetings or great evangelists, but it will come through great people who are filled with great love, who love so unconditionally that people will stand in amazement and awe and say, I can never believe that there were Christians who were like this. That people will begin to inquire, had I known there was a church like this, I would have came years ago. Father, I thank you that people are being changed, not because they have to, but because they want to. But there's nobody that is becoming policemen for the kingdom of God, but instead they are manifesting the glory of God. The mystery of iniquity is working in us, and we're not asking you to deliver us. We're asking you to keep us strong in our faith, that we can go help other people who are right where we are. And when we're changed, they're changed. Help us. Help us to go find people who are dealing with the same issues we're dealing with. Help us for our cross, our paths to cross. The word of the Lord comes to this house and said, many of you are going to begin to meet people in the next three months. People that have been through similar situations. God is going to divinely plan for you to cross paths with people that you've never met before. And these people, when they talk to you, they're going to share things that you're going to say, my God, that is, I was where you are today. I just, I was there. I was in the same place. And the Lord says, as he does that, literally people are going to begin to minister. And you're going to see a whole new level of evangelization. You're going to see a whole new level of church growth in this place. As people are going to become one through covenant. As they become one through community and through relationship. As you begin to relate to them your mystery of iniquity. As you tell them that the person that you are today, you are not because of your successes, but because of your failures. When you look into their face and tell them, I am who I am today because of some of the mistakes that I made, I am a better person. So what you're going through is not designed to destroy you. It was designed to make you stronger and to make you better. Father, the people that are here today that are coming to the glory of God, there is coming a manifestation the like of which this house has never seen before. There is coming a level of growth, a level of maturity, a level of fresh outpour. Hey, the fresh breath of your mouth is blowing out on this place. And you shall bring to naught the work of iniquity. You shall bring to naught the lawless one. You shall bring to naught the one that denies that you are all in all. And you shall remove that that is becoming in our midst, that that we wrestle with daily, it is being purified from us that we may walk out your glory, your image, and your likeness. Father, we just thank you. We just glorify you. We just release the purpose and the plan of God. Come on and just begin to release it in your spirit.